and fill the paper with the message that it wants to send. I'm back with Amy Shira Title talking about her book, Fighting for Space, and we're going to talk now about her writing process. So Amy, you know, we had a great conversation in the first half of this. Um, now I'd just like to hear about writing the book, publishing it, all those details. Let's start with your your writing journey. Like, what made you decide to write? Did this book or just in general in general because I know that this is not your first we have yeah 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 no I am um, so I'm, I'm an only child I was definitely one of those quiet bookish kids who just always was always reading you know long car trips with my my family going out to visit family or family friends um you know I didn't have a sibling to talk to or anything and I but I had books I I do believe that I willed myself to get over my motion sickness so I could continue to read in cars because I liked to read on these long car trips so much oh my god um, so much connection right here I I <laughs> <laughs> like let me just tell you, my, we took a trip to to England and like the Highlands and stuff when I was like eleven years old, and I just still have this image of and we rented a caravan, right? And it had a bed over the driver's seat. And I was allowed to lie in the bed, and it had windows in the front of it. And I was sitting there reading Gremlins at the time, okay. and I remember like pulling up on Stonehenge with Gremlins in my hand. So I was the same. I'm only nice. child nice. reader. Yeah. 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 So yeah, no, I've always loved, I've always loved books. I've always loved the power of books and I always wanted to write. I always thought it would just be so cool to write books. And then, you know, I fell in love with, with mid-century history and this fascination with kind of the insanity of, of early space and aviation and how wild and quickly it developed. And, and I love, I just wanted to be able to convey that to a reader and convey that to an audience. And, you know, not only do I love, I love those moments when, you know, as you're writing something, you see it coming together. You see the way that's, cause I write history. So like you see the way, like, oh my God, that person was there. Oh, that lines up so perfectly for what happens 10 chapters later. And you can kind of weave this whole story. It's, it, it, it's like, it's like art. And when everything falls into place, it's just this beautiful feeling of like, it, it just, it fits and it works. It just feels amazing. And I, I, I've always loved that. So I'm, I, I always say, you know, first and foremost, I am a writer because that's what, where I feel the most natural. That is so great. Uh, well, I have to ask you then, did you, you know, you had your first book, um, and then this one, did you, do you feel any fear about it or reservations? About about, about writing, writing in about put, yeah, about writing, about oh, putting it out yeah. there, about putting yourself out there. <laughs> there has never there. I don't think I've ever published anything, be it a YouTube video, a blog post, anything where I haven't been really, really worried that it won't go over well, that I missed something. You know, there's always that fear because you, you know, there, there is that saying that art is never done. You just decide to release it and you, you have to do that. You know, especially with the book, you've got a deadline with a publisher. You can't work on, I mean, you can work on it until it's perfect, but like, it's going to take you 25 years. And then you're, you know, writing for the one other person who's done all your work and who wants to read that. So it really is this balance of like doing everything as best you possibly can, but knowing that at some point you do have to let it go. Um, but you know, it's, it is, it's still, you, you, I think that's part of the fun of writing is like really challenging yourself to get to where you feel safe with other people seeing it within the time frame that you kind of have to because it's 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 also a job well then tell me tell me about your process for this book in particular like your research process and anything that you have to add about like your the development of your writing that got you to yeah. the point that you could pull this together yeah, well, this this book is really different from my first book, Breaking the Chains of Gravity, which is, you know, it, it Breaking the Chains does have the narrative, but it's not about, you know, one or two or three people. It's really about, like, it's a history of an organization. So it kind of brings in different people who you see, back, you know, coming back in afterwards, but it's got less of a, like a flow. And I, I really wanted to write something and for, for myself too, I wanted to write something to prove that I could write as a narrative, that I could write something that was really more accessible. I wanted this book to feel like a novel. And I read a lot of like, I read a lot of, you know, I think it's technically called upmarket fiction, like women's books, you know, the, the, you know, just like the stuff that you read in a day, because it's just like super fun, engaging it's the stuff that's turned into rom-coms so that I could actually see how these 
really prolific writers draw, write a narrative that draws you in. And like, obviously I'm working with completely different material, but I wanted to write something that would be that engaging. So I did kind of study fiction a little bit when writing this book to learn how to kind of structure, you know, where to leave things hanging to keep the reader hooked. Um, but when I started with the idea, actually, my, my original approach was to do a dual biography of Jerry Cobb and John Glenn so that I could have the female and the male perspective and to show because they were born, um, I think they're born a year apart or the same year. I think Jerry was born in 1931 and I think John Glenn was born in 1930. So they have this really interesting parallel. Well, they grew up very similar. They had very similar careers, very similar times, but him being a man had very different access to things. And Jerry had very, you know, her own path. But I, I didn't like that because it felt too on the nose. It felt a little bit too on the nose. And as I was, you know, getting more into Jerry's story, I started learning more about Jackie. And as I got more into Jackie, I realized that, you know, I, I, I honestly, I had the moment of like, why have I never heard of her? Like she's actually mentioned in Breaking the Chains of Gravity. And I didn't remember because she's, she's this like throwaway mention of, you know, and, and you know, this famous pilot, Jackie Cochran flew the, the video or not the video, obviously, but like the, the film of this rally for Eisenhower over to Eisenhower in England to convince him that he was needed at home to run for president, you know, that the people wanted him as their leader. And, you know, she's got this throwaway mention in there, but I still, like, I never dug in because nothing ever said, like, you should learn about Jackie Cochran. And I became fascinated with her, not only because of what she achieved as a pilot, but the fact that she also ran this hugely successful makeup line and that she refused to compromise her femininity for her technical side. And I kind of just loved that, like, She's, she's such a fascinating character and she's, pilots know about her, but like no one has ever heard of her outside of pilots. You know, it's really weird. So I, once I kind of found that, it was like, well, this is the, this is the story. And it's, it's gotta be by virtue of the age, it's gotta be Jackie. And then Jerry comes in as the second, and then they kind of, you know, balance out for the rest of it. And that kind of opened things up because um, I want, I like to do as much, obviously, primary research as possible, which is very hard or easy, depending on who you're looking at. But, you know, Jackie, with all of her connections, she was close personal friends with Eisenhower. So I was reading a couple books about Jackie and noticed that one of the authors, um, all of her sources were the Eisenhower Library. So I got in touch and I got the finding guide and I was like, oh my God, literally everything she ever saved is in the library it's there it's public record like I can I, I can have it so I went out to Abilene Kansas which is a very adorable town that has some restaurants and the Eisenhower library it's a, it, is, it is the sweetest little town I've ever visited um and I spent like a, a total of two weeks in the library and I literally just sat there with my phone and it was just like photograph flip photograph flip foot and I and I read it all later I didn't have time to read it I came back with six thousand pages of material because she kept everything oh my wow. god she kept everything so all of these letters all of these letters that like someone cc'd her on a copy of something she wrote this letter to jerry jerry wrote her a handwritten note on hotel stationery she kept that so i had all of these things and it's those little details that you know that jerry wrote a note on hotel stationery and i know that they were there in paris for the same event that they were in the same hotel that you, you can almost feel in jerry's handwriting I love handwriting because it tells you so much. You can feel in Jerry's writing that it was like a quick off the cuff note that it wasn't something she was really planning over versus Jackie who dictated every letter that she wrote because it was, you know, she couldn't spell very well, but also because it was a matter of decorum for her that these different tones, you know, this, this famous uh, LBJ letter where, you know, it's this, this letter that his secretary wrote advising Jim Webb to please, you know, consider women for NASA. And he wrote in, you know, he could have signed it and could have made it happen, but he said, let's stop this now that he wrote it in big block letters and then file and double underlined it. And you can see in the pen strokes that he was kind of fed up. And it's this really fascinating, like these little details that you get from what was saved, the, the handwritten notes in the margin of letters of like, I hate you know, I don't know what it was, but like you get these little details that come out with it. So that was, that was the best part for me was finding all of these and they're just in boxes in my closet. I can't bear to put them in a storage unit yet. They're just still up here, but all of you're, these You're things, like, Jackie, you're going to save everything. I know. I know. Oh, you have no idea. I, I, so like, I think part of my fascination with Jackie is just how uncompromising she was as, and in that she refused to let people 
box her in anywhere. Like, you know, she was married. She got married in her 20s, but she was never Mrs. Odlum. She was Jackie Cochran. She was Miss Jackie Cochran. But privately, she was Mrs. Floyd Odlum. And I always thought that was so interesting. I, I love that she has this makeup and cosmetics line, that she had this very feminine side that was, she, you know, she used it in kind of selling selling her line that she wouldn't get out of a plane. She'd be holding her lipstick. Uh, and that would be which, Don't you have some paraphernalia from that? I do. I do. Actually, I'm going to get up and I'm going to grab one thing that I think is it's such a cool find that uh, just one second. Hang on. Okay. <laughs> So eBay is like an amazing thing that exists because <laughs> as I started getting into the weeds, looking at the kind of the breadth of Jackie, it's so interesting that I would either find articles about her from aviation blogs as a pilot or articles about her on makeup blogs as a cosmetics line. The two never seem to cross. And I thought that was really interesting too, that like, you know, cosmeticians or, or you know, the makeup historians or whatever would be like, she also was a pilot. They never talked about the fact that she was so decorated. The the aviation stuff that I read never mentioned that she had a, this version in cosmetics line. So I have um, a couple of compacts. I can lift them up and kind of show you, but like there's the very ornate, I don't know if it's going to show up on camera, but the very ornate it's, JC, I think it's not going to Move it back a little bit. There we yeah. go. How's that? the very ornate JC for Jackie Cochran. And it's it's still in very good shape. There's my screen. Um, I have, there's this other little one that's in like pristine condition with a little, the little pad. That's gorgeous. <laughs> and um, one of her, one of her things was the, the perk up stick, which is, you know, you see, I, we see these now. I remember those, you um, talking those, about this. Yeah, those, that little thing where it all unscrews and becomes this, you keep all of your stuff in it. And it just unscrews and you have different compartments for your, I mean, this still has old lipstick in it. It's a great color. I'm not going to touch it, but it looks beautiful. Um, so she also had, which, which um, was, was a, was a gift actually is the perk up kit, which is this little thing that, Oh my God, the mirror is not glued in anymore, but um, she always talked about it as being designed to fit in your flight bag. So the mirror <laughs> that just fell out is here, but it's got your perfume, your little perk up stick, your lipstick and then your your paddle for application so you don't have to touch anything when you've been flying and you know she always did this 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 stuff of like well if it works for miss cochran in the air then it will work beautifully for you on earth and all this you know it was this really interesting facet of her that i just i i started digging all of this stuff out because it was just the she had so many sides to her that were never fully discussed and i wanted to kind of bring them together finally so this old fake leather <laughs> <laughs> kit from the 50s or 40s even yeah it's so cool and but that's like a lot of information to call through how did you organize yeah. it all oh difficultly uh no I um I what I did basically I had all of the paperwork that I found I I read through it all and I kind of sorted it and I, I had it in different piles different kind of categories so one would be letters one would be letters re you know, women in space, and then it would be by by year, and then sequentially by month within the year, and those would each be in a folder so I could find them. And then it would be uh, handwritten notes, re f, you know, faster than than sound flight, uh, Jaeger related, and within that, anything that was like a really important important piece, I would put a post-it note on it and write what the letter was so that flipping through it, I could very easily find the like really key letters that I knew that I was going to want to reference. Like, like there's this, this, um, in the book, I talk about this meeting that Jackie and Jerry had right before John Glenn went to space. And the two of them wrote some long letters back and forth to each other where they were trying to get on the same page and they just couldn't see eye to eye. And Jackie has copies of all those letters. She has copies of what Jerry wrote her, obviously, but also what she wrote to Jerry. So I have it, I have it as the Jerry letters in this, in this folder so I can easily find them. So, you know, anything that was really important is kind of highlighted for me within my own system and I could easily kind of get back. And what I would do basically is as I was, you know, I had the basic outline of the book kind of sketched out in my head and then I went once I, you know, knew where I, what I was looking for, I went to the LBJ library, the Eisenhower library, got in touch with some other libraries I didn't have to go to and kind of, you know, got all this stuff together. And then I sat down and I went through it all. And then I sat down, I went through it all again and any letter that was interesting, any document, I typed it out in full. And so I had it easily accessible in a word document and I could, you know, cut out the sections that I wanted or whatever. And, and that became like 
this awful what I call the crap draft, <laughs> which is as you is know every me, first draft. Yeah, every draft is that just awful. We'll never see the light of day draft, and it's you know me kind of writing the pieces, and then like then there was this letter, and then here's the letter, and then you know narrating, and then here's the letter, and then then from there going in and like making it readable. So it was this just kind of like I describe writing almost as like you've got very short hair, but, <laughs> but if you have, you know, when you have long hair, I used to have shower, long hair down. You, have, down you have long down. hair. Okay. So, you know, when you have long hair, you get out of the shower, it's kind of a mess. You have towel dry. It's a bit of a mess and you brush it and it gets a little bit smoother and you brush it again and it's a little bit smoother. And as you, you know, as you brush it and style it, it becomes a smooth thing. I mean, I straighten my hair, so it becomes a smooth thing. That's how I see editing that like it's, it's, it's that messy tangle. And then every time you go through it, it gets a little bit smoother, a little bit smoother. And you just keep going through and going through and going through. And it just ends up, you just do that until you see it. You see what's in your head on the page. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love that. I, I see it more as a, as a painter um, mm. where you sketch something and then you start to fill it in with color. And yep. then eventually it starts to actually like have depth and yeah, yeah. so nice. uh, but i love the hair yeah. analogy it's awesome i don't know it's because like, i it's because i work from top to bottom <laughs> that's that's <laughs> that's where that came from top to bottom that's so awesome so when you like you decided you were going to do this book at what point in that evolution did you start looking for publication like um, you said you started with a dual biography with Jerry and John Glenn and then switched to Jackie. And then at some point, did you do a proposal? Do you have an agent? How did all that work? Um, for, for that book, I did, I did have an agent at the time. Um, and she and I worked really closely in trying to get the structure of it, kind of what we agreed was really strong. You know, she knows publishing, she knows what's really gonna gonna work. And um, I know the story. So between the two of us, you know, we really workshopped it to make sure that it was as strong as possible. And um, from there, workshopped the, the proposal, which was, you know, something like 125 pages. Like it was a huge endeavor. I, I spent more time writing the proposal. Yeah, yeah. let's pause on that, that mm -hmm. point what so 125 pages of a proposal yeah. so you you yeah. had you developed the outline of the book and then you wrote what and then and then presented yeah it. like how does that okay. work for people <laughs> um i mean i think proposals differ from like what you're working on who you're working with what your audience is and everything but for me and my agent what we were looking for with this it was like i said 125 or something pages so like the introduction that's kind of hooking you with the book for like a couple of pages to kind of like really get you get you like okay i want to know more and then there's the over oh, the brief overview which is kind of like the the slightly longer version sort of showing where it all works but then there's the part of that is like the why this book needs to exist the you know why is it important why does it need to be written has it been done before what is this bringing to the table that other books that are similar have not covered or have missed or something um and then with that that feeds into the why am i the person to write it because you have to also sell yourself you can't just be the author you also have to have a social media profile you have to have you know some kind of credentials behind you so you have to sell yourself as part of that as well and then you get into the um i don't even remember i mean the structure i think varies but then you get into like the chapter summary and it's kind of an annotated thing where you look at like here's the chapter here's what it does here's kind of where where things fit in the overall narrative and then you have the longer overview. <laughs> um, I think there's the longer overview that kind of like teases all of that out and shows kind of where it all overlaps. And then I had a sample chapter in mind, which basically was my chance. Cause like in all of that, you're, you're explaining, you're showing what's happening, but the sample chapter is the part that kind of starts to show you or show the reader um, how you write and like why your writing is engaging and lets that actually speak for itself. So that ended up being like a massive undertaking. And I definitely spent more time writing the proposal than I did the actual book because in writing the proposal and reworking the proposal so many times, I was also doing the research at the same time. Like we were, I, you know, I knew what was happening. It was just a matter of finessing it. And as I was doing that, I was, I was going to the libraries. I was getting more pieces together. So it, it kept changing because I kept learning more and it got bigger and bigger because I was researching it. Um, and, you know, the, 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 by the time, you know, we sold the book, 
and we had a publisher and we had a contract it was like a year and a half to actually deliver the manuscript versus like three years of nailing down the structure and like what the how the proposal would actually be shaped getting it perfect to where you could sell it so like the proposal is the hardest part it's harder than writing the book because that's where all the work happens um which is why like writing another book is you know it'll happen eventually but like the proposal is the most daunting part because it's just like okay <laughs> it's going to change a million times and you have to be okay with that you have to be you know you have to have a, a sense of what you want your vision to be but also where you're willing to let things change as the ideas evolve and as people give you feedback too so it's it's a really it's it for me it's always i mean for the with this book it was a very collaborative process um which is great because i think you know at the end of the day you can kind of be your own worst enemy when it comes to creativity and, and bouncing off of somebody else can be really really important Wow. All of that is super fascinating <laughs> and informative. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so there's a small note in your um, acknowledgement section where you talk mm -hmm. about the scary legal end of things. Are you willing to share any of that? What's the, was that the note thanking my lawyer? <laughs> I think so. That, the, the scary legal end of things might literally have been that anything when we get into any kind of legalese, it just kind of freaks me out. Okay. Um, because, do you know what I mean? There, there was nothing. There was nothing big that happened. There was no like issue that happened. Um, but it's it's just one of those things where like you know clearing, having to clear the passages of. I mean, I, I literally had to give John Glenn's estate the two hundred and nine words from his memoirs that I quoted um to get clearance to use those words i had to show them the context to make sure they understood that i wasn't saying anything negative against him that i was just i was telling part of his story as it related to this one um because you know other stuff like from the senate or the uh, congressional subcommittee that's public record so i don't need to clear that with anybody but using his memoir was a different story um so you know trying to to make sure that all that stuff was cleared getting uh, clearance to use all the images and stuff that's all foreign to me that's the stuff that like as a writer i don't want to do that can't someone else do that stuff? Because like, I don't want to miss something and have that come back to me. And it's 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 that thing where like, you never want all the work you did putting in put put into writing a book, you know, becomes problematic, because you you didn't clear one of the image licenses properly. And then that becomes an issue. You know, it's it's that kind of stuff that you never think about until you get on a call with the publisher's legal team and realize that you got to you got to make sure you're doing it right because if that's not their job that's your job so oh I, so that's what i was going to ask is it yeah. was it your job yeah that oh, was wow. my job to get clearance for everything and um you know it's also just straight up nav uh, negotiating the book contract i mean that was that was a thing um not not a major thing by any stretch i just i learned a lot every time i negotiate a contract um well, but, you know, my say, lawyer so what's your agent doing you said you had an agent my, my agent my agent sold the actual book and she kind of knew what was what she took it to publishers she took it out to to market and made sure i mean what her most valuable part was honestly helping me workshop the proposal because my you know my original idea that i i had been firm in in my head for like two years of the jerry cobb john glenn story i don't think that would be nearly as strong as what we ended up finding so yeah. she, she wouldn't let me half ass it she pushed me to make it better and find more things and really bring it to where it got. And then she, you know, she was able to negotiate with the publishers to get, you know, a, a better advance, a better situation, but she's not a lawyer. So you still need the lawyer to actually go over the contract and the legalese. And, you know, my, my agent, one of the things that I, I had brought up and my agent brought up, but we still needed the lawyer to put it in the contract was if it was optioned for an audiobook, I wanted to narrate it because my first book was optioned for an audiobook and I didn't wasn't given the option of narrating it and because I you know I've done TV interviews I have a YouTube channel people know my voice and people said that it was jarring to read my book and not hear me read it so that was one of my first things I was like that's that's in there like you you put that in there so you know my lawyer helped make sure that that the contract was you know my agent could say, well, we want this and this and this, but the lawyer had to be the one that said legally speaking, you know, she does all my contracts. I, I every, everything, you never know when someone's trying to take advantage of you or put you in a situation that's bad. So she was the one that made sure that like everything was buttoned up on the legal side. Um, and also helped me make sure that 
all of the rights that I got for all the all the images and everything, she and my publisher helped make sure that it was the correct licensing, that it was the correct number, the correct duration. Cause like, I don't know anything about this stuff. So yeah, that's, that's the stuff that's scary when you have to do it for the first time. Yeah, that's very, yeah. that's very good information. Oh my gosh. And I never terrifying. thought about it. Yeah, right. It's just, it's as soon as you have to get legal clearance, just the word just like makes me nervous. Cause like my first book is all military and NASA. It's all public domain. I didn't have to get licenses. That's one of my favorite things that working in government, government uh, archives and stuff is that it's all fair use. All of the images from Jackie's archive are all, are all public access. Yeah. They're in the commons. Yeah. 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 That's so fascinating. Well, so, you know, there are so many unexplored topics in women's history and aviation. Um, and so we have potentially a lot of listeners who might be interested in digging into those. What advice uh, do you have for other writers who want to take on a monumental project like this? And, and what lessons have you learned that you haven't shared already? Oh, man. I feel like the... Um good question i feel like the the most important thing if you want to take on a big topic or a big something that's you know something that's huge that's you know it's in your wheelhouse but it's still kind of stretching you as a creative as a writer as a researcher is just like be be firm in what you want it to be because i think that's where people can risk getting into trouble is like you want it to be this book but someone convinces you that this is the right way forward like you have to do what at the end of the day you are proud of and that you love because if you are if you end up getting you know eyes deep in something that you're like i didn't i didn't want it to be like this then you're not going to have fun and you're going to produce a bad product but if you love it you're going to love the process you're going to love researching it you're going to love what you find so you have to love what you do but you also have to be okay for things to kind of destroy your image of something um because you might find out something that you don't want to know you might find out that someone that you you know you're writing a biography of someone that you really admire and then you find out something terrible about them and you have to be able to reconcile that both for yourself and as a researcher and a writer to make sure that you're presenting it you, you, you're allowed to have your own opinion in it, but like if you want to present something that's neutral, that allows your reader to feel something, you have to be able to be comfortable sitting with the discomfort of finding out something that you don't want to have to discuss. And that that's actually, I think, a challenge that a lot of people don't talk about. But when you when you live with characters, when you live with historical figures for years, you get attached. You know, it's it's something that I think invariably happens. I have a painting of Jackie's house that she owned hanging up over there because I just I, I found it on on eBay and I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> it's, you end up following, you end up just getting so involved with these people. You know, I have I, I got the copy of Jerry's memoirs. I got I got them signed. I bought used signed copies because it was just so cool to have something that she held. You know, having that stuff, I think it's, it's, you end up finding out things that you're like, well, this is uncomfortable, but you got to work with it. Um, but also like, don't be afraid at some point you do, you would have to not be afraid of like sharing it with people. So have some people close to you that you trust to give you honest feedback who will, you know, tell you when it's good, but also just be honest with you that it's, that's not working and like, know that it's not personal. Cause it's really, really hard for someone to say, this isn't good. I'm sorry, this is all good, but this, this isn't good. Like, it's really hard. You do have to be a, and like, I struggle with that. I straight up struggle with that. Um, it's, it's hard, but you have to, you have to trust yourself to be able to get it, to get it there. Oh, that's so good. You know, um, first of all, as a military pilot and officer, approaching the world of writing and critique was very challenging to me because you know i can get critiqued on my flying all day long but getting critiqued on my writing was a very scary prospect it's for personal. me it's personal it's personal yeah. it's my and like i you at least have historical facts to work with i'm working with just creative mm -hmm. ideas out of my brain so yeah. it feels like i'm you know revealing my innards to the universe yeah. and, and being judged on them and we're about to start um our first critique group so uh the reason that i do these this portion of the interview is to hopefully inspire other women in aviation to either use their experiences in their own writing or to have their curiosity piqued by somebody fascinating yeah. in our history and to write about them. And we have 112 members in our Aviatrix Writers nice. Group. It's really nice. And we're about to start critique groups. And I have taken on 
um, for people who have never done critiques before. And, and this is one of the things that mm -hmm. I want to, we're going to talk about in our first um, meeting is just the, the strange new world of receiving critique. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The strange I mean, and uncomfortable world. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've dabbled in like fiction, just short stories and stuff. And it's, it's so much harder. I've never, none of the fiction I've ever written has ever seen the light of day. Cause it's so hard. Um, cause fact is definitely a comfort thing where, you know, that you have, yeah, but I think, it, and when it comes to fiction, especially it's important to remember that like, you're not going to, you're not writing for everybody. Not everybody's going to love what you do and that that's fine. That if somebody doesn't like it, it doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean that it's a bad idea. It just means that it's, that's not your target audience and that's okay. So it is, but it is, that doesn't make it easier to let go and, and open yourself up to that. But it is an important, it's a really important part of the writing process. Yeah. It's it, yeah. any kind of critique that way is scary. So, mm -hmm. well, so, um, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about, about writing and publishing that people should know? I don't think so. Okay. Is there anything else that I should say? <laughs> well, uh, well, okay. So you talked already about um, sort of the backlash that you received from your audience in the first part of our interview mm -hmm. about this book, but really how's it going? Because I feel like this is a wonderfully, it, I feel like it achieves what you were, were shooting for, yeah. which is broad appeal. Um, it, on a very fascinating topic that reads like a novel. Um, so how's it going? The, um, the hardest part about that book is that um, we released February 20th, uh, 2020, or February 18th, 2020. And, um, you know, two weeks later, COVID was all anyone would talk about. So every interview I had, every plan for a book signing, everything was canceled. And you, you don't have a long, there's no longevity in publishing. Like within a few weeks, you're no longer a new book that people are excited about talking about. So, you know, I, I had some issues with the publicity plan that I didn't think that it was supportive enough for what we were doing to begin with. And this was something that, you know, was, was, we were starting to address in early March of that year. And within, within a week, it was, it was gone. Like there was just nothing, there was no coming back because COVID had canceled absolutely everything. So I tried to do, you know, in lieu of a book tour, um, did a, a series of live, live streams on my YouTube channel, but you know, that's the, not the audience that wanted to see it. And I couldn't get in front of a new audience. So I ended up a year later, almost hiring a publicist to try to help gain some momentum. And that coincided with the paperback release. But you know, when it's a book that's been out for a year already, it still doesn't get a lot of coverage. So that book was a little bit DOA, which was really hard to deal with um, because I did put a lot of myself into it. And I am, you know, I think every cre every creator has things that are like, I've done a bunch of things, but there's the one thing that you're really proud of. And that's my one thing that I am really proud of. And um, the fact that it just never got the, the focus never got any attention, never really got anywhere, um, has kind of been really hard because now I have this, this book that exists that it's got great reviews. It just, it just never got anywhere. So it's been, it's really hard. And now, you know, looking forward to my, to my next book, I'm, I'm actually looking for an agent again. And it's, uh, it's, I, I feel like I'm just, I'm back to square one, even after having this book come out. So that, that's really hard. That's really hard. And it's, so it's just, it's a lot. It's a lot to start back at the beginning after, you know, having two books under your belt. And, you know, the, the, the reason that it didn't work was because the world died for a minute. You know, it's, it's so, it's so far out of your control that there's nothing you can do. You know, that's really disheartening to hear. Um, yeah. And it contradicts something. It, it contradicts a little bit a mantra that I have, um, you know, uh, within my community about, the ways in which we have like all of these, listen, I grew up in the military when we didn't have social media. Um, there weren't many women stationed with me. And so I didn't have instant access to examples or mentors in the world. Now people have all these fabulous um, yeah, yeah. women all over Instagram and, and TikTok and all these, all these places that they can look for mentorship. Yeah. But I am like, I am so supportive about the permanence of a book. And, how, mm -hmm. and the longevity of a book. So for here, to hear you say that yeah. there's no longevity in publishing, yes, yeah. I hear you in terms of like splash, but this book, 
you know, I, so, I talked yeah. recently about a book that I that I have had on my shelf for ten years that I finally read, and it was mm-hmm. there waiting for me. Where that Instagram post was gone, it's gonna be it's gone. gone. In a yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's true. The thing, the thing with social media, I think gives us this idea that like we can reach anybody and everybody on a dime, but it's, it's very fleeting. And you're right that books, you know, the, this book could be the sleeper hit, you know, it could, it could be that in five years, the right person reads it, tweets about it. And that gets the ball rolling on another wave of popularity. And that's, and that's great. And you know, that, that what you've put out into the world um, and the agent that I worked with on that book, you know, she, she got to talk me off a ledge to be totally honest. Like I, I was freaking out that I had this terrible sales record for this book. Um, my, my first book was published in the UK and we didn't have a big American release. So the numbers there aren't great either, but again, the reviews are really good. So it's one of those things where I have two books now that don't have the strongest sales records. And that makes me feel like I'm a very hard author to sell. And, you know, she had to tell me that like you, you wrote a good book and regardless, you know, it came out at the wrong time that's out of your control, but no one's going to look at that and say that it's because the book's not good. So you, you, the product that you made will always stand. It's just that in the immediacy of that release and wanting that, it's almost like that catharsis of celebrating that it's finally out in the wild to not get that is really hard. It's really, really hard. I had, I had three, I had three book events, um, you know, two of which I, I made special. So it's like, I never got that, that anything, you know, I, I honestly, I did a book, my first book signing out here in LA, uh, two people came. So the store owner called his, his boyfriend to come and hang out. So I had four people and it was just, you know, when it rains in LA, no one goes outside. So I had four people that came to my first book event. I, uh, I did one local to me and, you know, a bunch of friends came out. So it was, it was great to see people, but it was people that were there to support me. I had one in Toronto that my parents invited everyone they've ever known to. So it was a big turnout, but it was everyone I've ever known. So it was that, that thing of like, this feels like I made my own party for it as opposed to like having the celebration of like it, you know, people like it. So I never, I never got that because we, we didn't have that, a normal release at all. And it was, that was really hard. It's still really hard that it's just kind of like, it just stopped. (laughs) I'm so sorry to hear that. I'm so sorry to hear that, especially with a book that is so well-researched and so well-written. I I'm really, really hard. That is heartbreaking to hear. Yeah. And I will promote it as much as I can. With, <laughs> so yeah, with, I, th- I mean, maybe, maybe that's the community that I have. So, you know. but maybe that's the other thing just to mention is that like, you know, if th- things might not work out the way you envision, you might not have, you know, the big release and it has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do. It can be totally outside your control. It says nothing about what you've done and it doesn't make it less hard to deal with the fact that you're not quite getting what you hoped to, to come from it. So yeah. Well, what I wish for you is that whatever you're working on next turns <laughs> out to be the big break for you. And then when people find out about that, they want to go back and read all of your other stuff. Just like I want to go back and read your <laughs> other book, Breaking the Chains of Space. I want to read that now. So, um, Amy, thanks for being Thank so <laughs> generous with your time and with your experience yeah, it because it's really like it's really helpful to people who are considering pursuing mm-hmm. these things. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, if I can if I can impart any wisdom to people, then I, I feel like I've put some good back into the world. So, you know, happy to. You happy have to. been imparting much wisdom to the world. So thank you. <laughs>